संधान और गुजरात इंटीग्रेटेड क्लासरूम सैटेलाइट ना माध्यम से जोड़ती कड़ी एटले संधान गुड मॉर्निंग माय डियर स्टूडेंट्स इन दिस लेक्चर वी आर इन पेपर नंबर 211 ऑफ सेमेस्टर 4 you know what this paper is about the paper is called history of english literature 1798 to 1832 what age is this need i ask you that question now that you are students of sem 4 i'm sure you do remember what you began in sem 1 remember the foundation paper in which we introduced you to different ages the different ages of english literature the time period in which that particular age of english literature is considered and of course when i talk about 1798 to 1832 all of you will remember that we are talking about the romantic age and then you ask why 1798 i will have to remind you about that path breaking book which we call the lyrical ballads the lyrical ballads published in 1798 the preface and the book written by wordsworth and coleridge the first generation poets the first generation of the romantic age so in this paper you are studying about the history the characteristic features of the romantic age and then we go on to looking at the various writers you have already seen some novelists like jane austen and walter scott today we are going to look at a very important essayist the essayist that i am going to talk about today is charles lamb charles lamb the personal essayist a very important essayist of the romantic age the title as you see gives you his dates on the first slide you can see the dates of charles lamb charles lamb the essayist 1775 to 1834 1775 to 1834 1798 is the beginning of the romantic age as i've just mentioned he lived and wrote during this period what are the characteristics of this age this of course is a quick revision for you because you've already looked at the characteristic features of the romantic age just to name some of them you know that the literature of this period the writers of this period were very subjective in their writing in total contrast to the new classical age where writers like pope had objectivity in their writing these writers are very subjective and therefore words like me and my is often seen in the poetry of this period the second important quality of the romantic age is the importance of the imagination the writers of this period be they poets or essayists or novelists show a high ability for imaginative work and that is why the poets could sing of flying on the wings of poesy at keats were to do or a shelley would do if i were a and he would be a leaf who would be tossed if he were the west wind etc so you notice that these writers of the romantic age had great imaginative ability the third important quality that we must remember before i begin talking about charles lamb is that they gave greater importance to matter matter over manner the style was less important what they wrote about was more important and that is why i have said matter over manner the what was more important than the how there are many other features that we associate with the romantic age but these are three important features that are common to all the writers of the romantic age let us look at the next slide 
where we get some idea about what Charles Lamb wrote. I have already told you the period in which he lived, his year of birth and his year of death you already know. He began his writing with short poems. Today we do not remember Lamb as an essayist, we remember him more as a, we do not remember him, I am sorry, as a poet, we remember him more as an essayist. But he began his literary career by writing short poems. The second important work that he wrote were that famous book which is called Tales from Shakespeare. Shakespeare, as you all know, was the great Elizabethan dramatist. Charles Ram wrote the stories of the plays of Shakespeare and they are called Tales from Shakespeare. So if you want to know what a particular play of Shakespeare is all about and if you do not have the time, the energy, the interest or the ability to read the complete play, it might be a good idea to go to Tales from Shakespeare by Charles and Mary Lamb. Mary was a sister. I shall talk about her later when I talk about his essays. The third important work that Charles Lamb wrote was Specimens of English Dramatic Poets who lived about the time of Shakespeare. I am sure you get that clear that it was the Elizabethan age that he is talking about. Remember, to any student of literature, the Elizabethan age is an important age. When we talk about the various ages and the contribution of various writers in these ages to English literature, there are certain ages which are very important and of these the Elizabethan age is most important. I am repeating myself when I say that we talk about Charles Lamb as an essayist and that is why the essays of Elia are very important. Who you might ask is Elia? Elia is a pen name that Charles Lamb took. The pen name is a name that writers who do not want their identity to be known take on in their works. So the essays of Charles Lamb have come down to us as essays of Elia and later essays of Elia. Elia is a name that he chose. Critics have played the guessing game about where the name came from. Of that we are not very sure because there are many theories but certainly his essays are popularly known as the essays of Elia. The next kind of work that Charles Lamb wrote is his literary criticism. Lamb worked as a clerk for many, many years, for almost 30 years. He lived in London, but he did read a lot. He was fond of reading, he was fond of books and from that reading probably is born his literary criticism. So we have Lamb writing some poetry, some criticism, some tales, some stories from Shakespeare and of course his essays. What kind of essay did Charles Lamb write? I am sure you remember the neoclassical age where the periodical essay was very popular. It was then that with the printing press, with an increase in the reading public, with more and more writers turning to writing the essay, which we call the periodical essay because they were published in periodicals, that the essay as a literary form gained prominence and popularity. But when we talk about Lamb, we talk about another kind of essay. It might be a good idea at this stage to remember one of the first essayists in English, Francis Bacon, who wrote what is called the aphoristic essay. So, to quickly remind you, you already know the aphoristic essay that Bacon wrote in the period of the Renaissance. You know the periodical essay which writers like Addison and Steele 
and Johnson, Dr. Johnson, mind you, not Ben Johnson, Dr. Johnson and Goldsmith and Swift wrote. These were the periodical essays, essays who wrote essays in the 18th century or in the neoclassical period. But I am going to talk to you at length about Charles Lamb and the essay that he wrote, as I mentioned to you, is called The Personal Essay. Let me first try and describe to you what are the chief characteristics of a personal essay. It is personal. So it is almost as if the writer, the essayist, is having a conversation with his readers. What do I mean by that? It is a very informal kind of essay writing. It is a mixture. It is an interesting mixture. It is an informal mixture of storytelling, fact, wisdom and personality. When I talk about some of the essays of Charles Lamb, I will show you how all these characteristics come across so beautifully in the essays that Lamb wrote. What do we have? We have storytelling. He narrates some incidents and so beautifully in Dream Children. There are facts because we come to know about his childhood. There is wisdom because he tells us how we should learn to sympathize with somebody who has less. And Lamb did it to a great extent in the way in which he took care of his sister Mary, who had been and who was almost till her death quite insane. So you have wisdom and of course the personality of the writer, of the essayist comes across. It's not an autobiography, my dear students, but we do get glimpses of the personality of the writer. So what are the characteristics? I'm going to have more for you, but let's quickly sum up some of the characteristics. One, it's like a conversation. Two, it is very informal. Three, it is storytelling. Four, it combines facts with wisdom. Five, we do get to see the personality of the writer. I hope you are taking down your notes because that's important for you to remember after you go back home or when you are preparing for your exams. Shall we continue with the characteristics, my dear students? Well, the next one is the personal essay examines a subject outside of the self. I just told you it's not an autobiography. We are talking about something else, but we are looking at it through ourselves. Think of a camera, you have the lens. The self becomes the lens through which you view something outside of you. I'm thinking of a beautiful essay called Old China. You know, China is the name of a country, but China is also the kind of, you know, the cup and saucer that you use at home. You know that it is called China, probably Chini Mitti, we call it. Well, he talks about old China. He describes the beautiful cups, the old cups and saucers that he had. He talks about how they bought it and he also describes. So it is his own idea of what he sees, the designs that he sees on the cup. So we are viewing something, we are viewing old China but we are viewing it through the lens of the self. The subject of the personal essay may be the self, but the self is treated as evidence for the argument. That is, the writer is telling us something. He is telling us something about something, but through that we also come to know something about the self. We come to know something about the personality of the writer of the essayist, in this case Charles Lamb. The passages of narrative appear but generally get used as evidence for the argument. There are lots of narrative, lots of stories maybe, descriptions. I would like to draw your attention to a beautiful essay that he wrote called Dissertation on a Roast Pig. The description of the roast pig you might say, I'm a vegetarian, true, but this is an essay that we are talking about. He talks about how 
the custom, the tradition of having roast pig began. Hilarious, comic, the way Charles Lamb describes it. The narration is there, but he uses it as evidence for his argument. Those are the general characteristics of the personal essay that we looked at. Let us now look at some of the major essays of Elia. Essays of Elia, let me remind you that Elia is the pen name that Charles Lamb took. So, I have put it in brackets for you so that you remember that Elia is actually Lamb. But when you look at a book, the book that you are likely to find in your library will be called Essays of Elia. That is the name of the text and the writer of course is Charles Lamb, the famous personal essayist of the Romantic Age. I am giving you a list of some of the famous essays that we find in Essays of Elia and later Essays of Elia. The South Sea House was where his office was located, Oxford in the vacation, Christ's Hospital, New Year's Eve, All Fool's Day, Grace Before Meat. In each of these essays, the characteristics of Lamb that I talked about do come across. What are the characteristics? Can you quickly try and remember? Remember, it is an informal talk that he is having with his readers. Some more essays, Grace Before Meat, My First Play, Dream Children. Just to give you an idea of how all the characteristics can be seen in the essays of Elia, the characteristics that I listed for you before I gave you the names of the essays, I want to talk about Dream Children, A Reverie for some time. You will enjoy listening to it, my dear students, because Lamb is in conversation with his readers. How does he do it? He imagines that there are children sitting in front of him, his children, and he starts talking to them about his childhood. Remember, there are sitting in front of him his children, and he is talking about his childhood. That means he is talking about the past. He describes his own childhood. He talks about the wonderful summer vacation that they spent in grandmother's house. He talks about how wonderful a woman his grandmother was. He talks about his brother who had a limp. He talks about that brother who died and how when the brother was alive, Lamb showed no sympathy for that brother who limped. He talks about that wonderful house where the great where the grandmother worked. And so the story goes on and on. And we enjoy going through the rooms of that big house where his grandmother worked. We love walking through the gardens, looking at the fruits, the fruit trees that they climbed. And then he talks about the woman he loved. And towards the end of the story, towards the end of the essay, comes the real sad fact that the children sitting in front of him are merely figments of his imagination. I am repeating that for you, my dear students, so you, that you understand the pain with which the sorrow, the sense of nostalgia with which Lamb is writing this essay. He is talking about those children who are sitting in front of him, but at the end of the essay he tells us that the children are not there at all. They are merely dream children because <clears throat> he did love a woman called Alice, but he never married her. She married someone else. And he tells us at the end of the essay that if he had married Alice, these would have been his children. I hope you understand the essay as I have described it to you. That the sorrow that Lamb feels in not having married Alice. In fact, I want to tell you at this stage, my dear students, that Charles Lamb never got married. He never married, remember, I told you I will talk about his sister again. He never married because he had this mad sister who he had to take care of. Why did he take, have to take care of her? 
just imagine she was so mad that in a fit of frenzy in a fit of madness she had stabbed her own mother she had killed her own mother poor mary was so mad but charles remembered the wonderful childhood that they had spent together in his essays he calls her cousin bridget but all of us who know lamb's life know that cousin bridget is actually his sister mary he never married because he wanted to take care of his sister mary of his mad sister mary and that is why he never married alice i just want you to understand by talking about this essay in detail i'm giving you an idea about the wonderful way in which charles lamb allows his personality to come through in his essays we feel that charles lamb is sitting in front of us as he says in his armchair many of the people about whom he has talked in this essay dream children have gone they are not even alive but he and his cousin bridget are still there do you understand my dear students now the title of the essay dream children a reverie what is a reverie a reverie is a dream a dream a memory a dream that you are probably having when you are awake it is filled with nostalgia for the childhood that lamb remembers that lamb feels sad about because many of those people are no more alive <coughs> another essay that we could look at is the praise of chimney sweepers some of you might remember a poem by blake that you may have studied in an earlier class where he talks about the woes the sorrows of the chimney sweeper it is difficult for us to imagine a chimney but i'm sure some of you have seen them in movies or in hill stations in those days there used to be young boys who would be forced to go down the chimney in order to clear the soot can you imagine they would have to come down that chimney it would be dark it would be filled with soot and they would be tied to a rope so that they don't fall down and they would go down the chimney and clean it up and lamb is talking about the chimney sweepers the other essay that i have mentioned is a dissertation upon roast pig I mentioned it in passing and I would like to mention it again. Lamb describes in detail how this tradition of the roast pig began. He says, and he writes it with such humor. We smile as we read through it. In fact, someone very beautifully said that when we read Charles Lamb, we smile through our tears because there are tears because there is sorrow, there is no nostalgia, there is something about what he has lost, but at the same time there is so much of humor. And therefore, he talks about a dissertation upon roast pig where he says there was this farmer who had gone out and when he was going out he told his son to take care of the baby pigs in the hut the son fell asleep the little boy he fell asleep the hut caught fire and all the pigs were dead the pigs were roasted alive when the farmer came back he was shocked to see that the pigs were dead he put his hand to it and remember because they were roasted because they had been burnt they were still hot the farmer's fingers were burning so he put it to his mouth and charles ram writes beautifully that that is how the taste of the roast pig first came to the farmer and ever since then farmers thought that they had to burn the hut in order to have roast pig lamb is making fun of the human inability to use their brains to do something properly a very humorous essay and if you do get time my dear students you must read some of the essays of lamb in order to appreciate them really having given you a list of the essays that lamb wrote 
Let me now talk about some of the characteristics of Lamb as an essayist. I began this lecture by telling you something about the characteristic features of the Romantic Age. And remember, Charles Lamb belonged to the Romantic Age. And hence, naturally, we do see some of those characteristics, many of those characteristics in Charles Lamb too. Remember, the first one that I talked about was subjectivity. You remember subjectivity, where the writer writes about himself. I talked to you about Keats and Wordsworth and Shelley, the poets, and also the writers like essays like Charles Lamb. Subjectivity. He deals with himself. He writes about his experiences. I hope you can see the difference between subjectivity and objectivity. In an objectivity, the writer is absent. In subjectivity, the writer is very present. He tells you what he thinks, what he feels about a subject. If I point out to something and say it is white, it is an objective statement because the object is at the center. But if I point to the same thing and say it has a nice color, you understand that the speaker probably likes the color white and therefore my second sentence becomes a subjective sentence. When we look at romantic writing, we would notice that a lot of it is subjective. The second characteristic that we see in Lamb as an essayist is that he deals with familiar subjects. There is a familiarity. He talks about childhood. He talks about uh, the experiences of vacation. He talks about hospitals. He talks about holidays. He talks about seasons. He talks about what people love. He talks about the experiences of the young as well as of the middle aged. He talks about his experiences as a clerk in South Sea House. Remember, all these are common, familiar experiences. And that is why the second point that I have for you is familiarity. There is nothing which the reader does not know. But he is able to make it so special that we enjoy Lamb's description. The third characteristic, the third feature, the third quality of Lamb as an essayist is his ability for imagination. Again, remember, this is a characteristic quality of all romantic writers. So, we see his ability for imagination. I just talked about dissertation on a roast pig where it is his imagination. Again, I talked to you about dream children, where he imagines that those children are sitting in front of him, listening to his story, when actually there are no children at all, because it is a reverie. We do notice that in his essays, there are bits of autobiography pieced together. I told you once before that Lamb is not writing an autobiography, but Lamb is writing about the self. Or even when Lamb is writing about something outside, he views it through the lens of the self. You have to imagine again, my dear students, a camera. A camera has a lens, but what is the lens that Lamb is using? The lens that Lamb is using is the self. That means Lamb is always present in all his essays. That does not make him an egotist. It's not as if he's proudly proclaiming about himself, but he's talking about life as he has seen it, as he has experienced it. And that is why we come to know a great deal about Lamb's life, Lamb's likes, Lamb's sorrows, Lamb's joys, Lamb's hobbies, etc. when we read Lamb's essays. And that is why I'm telling you that it is, seems as if all his essays are pieces of autobiography which have been put together. In his essays, we do get an idea about what Lamb liked, his whims. He loved buying old books. No, he loved going to old bookshops and looking at the books 
and feeling bad because he could not buy them. We see his prejudices in many of his essays, what he likes, what he does not like, we see all that. In his essays, we also come to know about his family members. I talk to you about his grandmother. I talk to you about his brother. I talk to you about his cousin Bridget. It is through the essays that we come to know about the family members, about the acquaintances, who his friends were, where he went, what he liked doing. We come to see all that. Remember, there is humor. But even when there is humor, there is also pathos. Pathos is a kind of sorrow. You know, it's not the kind of sorrow that you would call tragic or that you would associate with a tragedy. But it's a kind of sorrow that brings a lump through a throat. It's a kind of sorrow that brims, that makes your eyes brim with tears. It does not mean that you weep loudly, but the pathos is there. And that is why I repeat, when we read the essays of Lamb, we smile through our tears. There is humor and there is pathos. And there is a great, great love for humanity. The romantic writers, most of them, Lamb in particular, Wordsworth was another, where you see the love for humanity coming across in their writings. You see that in the Lucy poems, for example, of Wordsworth. You see that in the essays of Elia. The word Elia, remember the name, is of course a reference to Charles Lamb. It was the pen name that he took. Well, so you've got humor, you've got pathos, and of course you've got humanity. And that is why we say we smile through our tears. Have you quickly jotted down all the points, my dear students? Subjectivity, familiarity, imaginative, spontaneous, did I describe the word spontaneous? You remember Wordsworth's description, definition of a poem? A spontaneous overflow. So also in Lamb's essays, we find that he is not preparing to speak. He speaks as it comes to him. You know, there is a spontaneity about it. That means it's not as if it's artificially planned. I will say this after I say that, or I must say this before I say that. I must make them cry. I must make them laugh. There is nothing of this. It comes so spontaneously because he's talking. It is an informal chat between the reader and the writer. And that is why there is a spontaneity in all his writing. Let's look at some more of the characteristics that we see as of Lamb as an essayist. He is never assertive, never didactic. What is didactic? Preaching. What I'm saying is right. Everybody has to listen to me. This is the only way to do it. You don't see any of this in Lamb as an essayist. He's never assertive. You know, he's talking. He's talking to his friends. That is the feeling that we get. And therefore, he's never assertive. He's never didactic. You know, didactic is people who tell you that this is the only way to do it. They preach and they say nothing except this is right. But you never see that in Lamb. Yes, there is a feeling that he borrowed his style <coughs> from other writers. True. I've already told you that Lamb was very fond of reading. And when he read the Elizabethans, for example, maybe there was a lot in Elizabethan writing that he liked. And therefore, Sometimes we think that the style that he has is not his own. He has borrowed it. But I would go that far to say, of course he borrowed it, but he made it his own. As a critic has said, the blossoms are culled from other men's gardens, but their blending is all lamb's own. To cull is to collect. You know, you pluck some flowers from here and you pluck some flowers from there, and then you make it into a beautiful bouquet. Whose is the bouquet? The bouquet is yours. So also, Lamb collected blossoms. He collected flowers from other people's gardens. This is with reference to the style that I'm talking about now. It was a style which seems to be borrowed from earlier writers. Yes, he did borrow. He wrote in prose. But so often, the prose doesn't seem to be prose. The prose almost becomes poetry. There is such a beauty about it. And that is why one says 
that Lamb wrote in lyrical prose, which is almost as musical, as beautiful as poetry. Let us look at what some of the critics have to say about Lamb. As I explained to you what each critic says, some of the characteristic features of Lamb will become clearer. So remember the points that you've already made, you can add some more. There could be sub points to the points that you've made. We have talked about the characteristics and now we are looking at what critics have to say about Lamb. Compton Rickett, of whom of course you have heard, says, Never was any man more intimate in print than he. He has made chatter a fine art. You know chatting, you know the word chatting, you sit and chat with your friends. According to Crompton Rickett, it almost seems as if Lamb is chatting. But then it's an art because it's put into print. He's writing an essay and therefore he says nobody has made chatting into such a great art than Lamb has. He has made of chatter a fine art. He often addresses the reader as dear reader as if he were addressing a bosom friend. A bosom friend, somebody you are very close to, somebody who has been your friend from childhood, you would call them. You know, you are now in college, but maybe you are talking about a friend who you studied in nursery school together, in play school together. You would call such a friend a bosom friend. So, very often he talks about the reader, he addresses the reader directly as dear reader, as if he is addressing a friend. What does Kazamia say? You probably remember Legui and Kazamia, that fat book on history of literature. Maybe some of you have seen that book, it probably runs into more than a thousand pages. What does Kazamia say? Lamb is not a moralist nor a psychologist. His object is not research, analysis or confession. He is above all an artist. He has no aim save the reader's pleasure and his own. So what is he doing? He is not preaching. He is not a psychologist. He is not trying to understand the reader. He is not interested in research. He is not interested in analysis. He is not confessing, standing in a confessing booth saying that this is these, these are the sins that I have committed. No. What is he? He is an artist. And this artist, what is his aim? You remember, art has different, different aims. Somebody says to teach, somebody says to please, somebody says to elevate. And what does Lamb believe? According to Kazamia, there is only the reader's pleasure. So art to him is for pleasure. And therefore, in his writing, he is interested in giving pleasure to the reader and not in anything else. What does some other critic say? He would interrupt the gravest discussion with some light jest and yet perhaps not quite irrelevant in years that could understand it. He is talking about something very seriously, but you would find, you see that in old China. You see that in uh, South Sea House, he is talking about something very seriously and suddenly there will be a joke, there is a jest, a jest is a joke. A jest is humor, a jest is a comic aside and it would seem not irrelevant. What is the critic doing here? He is using two negatives. Instead of saying it is relevant, he says it is not irrelevant. Not irrelevant to the reader's ears. That means the reader understands exactly what Lamb is trying to say. So he is talking about something serious. And then suddenly he brings in something comic. He has something funny to say, but the reader can immediately understand the connection. How beautifully he is able to do it is what we are talking about. Let's look at another critic. J.B. Priestley observes in English humor, so we are talking about Charles Lamb's humor. English humor at its deepest and tenderest seems in him incarnate. He did not merely create it, he lived in it. His humour is not an idle thing, but the white flower plucked from a most dangerous nettle. A nettle is a very thorny plant, like 
the rose has thorns but the rose is yet a beautiful flower so also priestly says that his humor comes but the humor could come even from a situation which is serious which is sorrowful which is very very grave which is very very deep and that is why he says that his humor is incarnate it is complete it is total he did not do it for the sake of creating it humor was a part of his life remember he smiled through his tears and he taught us to smile through his tears and therefore his humor is not an idle thing but it has been plucked from the nettle from the thorny nettle another critic says like all the romantics he is self revelatory remember the point subjective bits of autobiography etc he is self revelatory but there is nothing in him of the egotistical he never tries to say i am great only i am great he talks about himself again to go back to the metaphor of the camera he is looking at the outside world through the lens of the self the writer's own character is always there flaunted before the reader but it is carefully prepared and controlled before it is exhibited he allows us to see bits and snatches of himself he allows us to see what he wants to show us and therefore there is a great deal of preparation in what he says have you understood the importance of lamb as an essayist of the romantic period have you looked at the characteristics of lamb as an essayist do you remember some of the names of the major essays that lamb wrote do you know the pen name under which lamb wrote do you know which age he belonged to do you know from which writer which dramatist he took the tales which we now know as tales of charles and mary lamb well if you know all this i must admit that you have been paying great attention to this lecture but remember the proof of the pudding is in the eating so do go back some time to your library pick up a book essays of elia and do read one essay and if you decide to read only one essay i think it should be dream children or old china all the best my dear students sandham all gujarat integrated classroom सैटेलाइट ना मध्यम थी जोड़ती कड़ी एटले संधान